Hey there folks, this is Daniel Fritter from Calibre Magazine and a long overdue video answering the most common question I've received since about mid-2023 and certainly all of 2024 thus far, and that would be what do I expect to see from a conservative government with regards to gun laws and why? Now I'm going to add a couple comments before I get into it really. The first is that I apologize if this video seems like it kind of gets a bit tangential or is hard to follow at times. This is going to be a very complicated subject with a lot of moving parts like a lot of political analysis is. I have tried to record it probably 30 plus times at this point. Uh, at this point, I've just got to get it out there because I think there's some things that need to be said. Uh, the second thing is that it's obviously all predicated on the notion that the Conservatives win a majority, which, you know, based on current polling, is certainly the most likely outcome with the most recent poll I saw showing them having 211 seats based on a model. But nonetheless, if they get a minority, pretty much everything I'm about to lay out will be a political impossibility. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get right into it and say that, and I've said this in the past, I do believe that, or I'm rather, I'm confident saying that the Conservative Party, if they should win the next election with a majority, will have likely no choice but to repeal pretty much everything the Liberals have done with regards to guns from C21 to the May 2020 OIC going as far back as Bill C71. And I think a lot of that is actually by design. I'll get into that a little bit later. And what I mean by that is quite bluntly that the Liberals have made all of this stuff for no other reason than to create political wedges and leverage things and make political gambits as we lead into the next election. So what do I mean when I say everything? Well, I mean everything from Bill C-71 to the May 1st, 2020 OIC that banned 1,500 different kinds of long guns and promised to buy them back, to C-21 that we saw pass Royal Assent at the tail end of 2023, to everything that we've been told to expect this year, being the magazine regulation changes that seek to limit all long guns to five rounds only, as well as an additional OIC promising to ban more long guns, I think the Conservatives will have to repeal all of it because they're all kind of interlinked, and I think that's part of the Liberal strategy here. But at the crux of the matter, I believe, is going to be the buyback. This is uh, a program that was launched, or announced rather, in May 1st of 2020, when then Minister of Public Safety Bill Blair and Justin Trudeau somberly intoned that they would ban, like I said, some 1,500 different kinds of long gun, including the AR-15, the CZ-858, the Ruger Mini-14, the Norinco M14, the Swiss Arms Rifles, the Robinson XCRs, as well as everything that produced over 10,000 joules of energy, so 50 BMG and big African game hunting rifles, as well as everything with over a 20 millimeter bore, which was weird because it included stuff that no one owns like grenade launchers and artillery pieces. But nonetheless, they did ban all this stuff and made a concurrent promise to quote unquote, buy it back. Now, this will be the first part that feels a bit tangential for viewers and I apologize, but I am going to call it a buyback. So please don't jump down my throat in the comments section there, gun owners. Um, I view my job mostly as media rather than advocate. I try, I try and let the information I share do the advocacy for me. So for that reason, I try and use the common vernacular because I try and get this stuff out to people that are not within the gun community. Obviously, those of us with these guns understand we didn't buy them from the government, so the government can't really buy them back. We also understand that this is really just a confiscation program with the potential for compensation. It's not, a, it's not an optional thing. Um, so it's not really a buyback, and I get that. But like I said, I want to use the common vernacular, and most people know this as the buyback. It's also just the easiest way to explain it. So if you're going to light me up in the comments, please feel free to do so. But uh, I do understand where you're coming from. It's just for the purposes of these videos and explaining to people, it's easiest to just use the common terminology, which obviously is buyback. I think the buyback is going to be at the core of it because it is kind of the largest program right now. Everything else has been held in a holding pattern of sorts. Even C21 that has banned handguns, the government doesn't really need to do anything beyond this to kind of affect that change. As gun owners die out, as their licenses lapse, these handguns are being seized by police relatively quietly and in relatively small volumes at any one time. So there's not a whole lot of headlines to be made there, nor actionable stuff to be done. But the buyback is an actionable item that must be completed. Now, by way of further background, there's a couple things that everyone needs to know about the buyback and the ban associated with it, just to satisfy everyone there. First off, the buyback was very heavily influenced by the New Zealand ban passed by Jacinda Ardern after the Christchurch massacre. 
Uh, there are some crucial differences, which we'll get into, but there are so many links between the two. The vernacular used was the same. The rhetoric used was the same. A lot of the documentation that we've seen from the government uh, being everything from the IBM program to memos and stuff that's been released via access to information requests have cited the New Zealand authorities as contributors to the program. And I don't mean contributors as in they've paid money and it's not some giant global conspiracy, but rather our government talked to the New Zealand government when they tried to concoct this plan because that's the plan that they were trying to mimic effectively. This will be relevant later, so if it doesn't make sense now, that's okay. The second thing that everyone needs to know is that the buyback is very much a real thing. It's not something that the government is going to scrap contrary to some things that I've seen online. They're not about to simply throw out the entire compensation model and simply seize your guns. I say that because the buyback actually has about 34 people working on it. It is a program that actually hasn't gotten off the ground largely because of a lack of staff, but nonetheless, they do have a lot of people working on this. It has been on average about a four to five million dollar line item per year on the government's budget. They're not about to scrap that. Government works very hard on a momentum sort of basis. Uh, things that exist right now are very hard to make not exist. See also the entire Canadian Firearms Program. Uh, so it's not something that's going to disappear overnight. Now, the third thing that people need to realize is that there is an amnesty in place and has been extended until October of 2025. Uh, for those that don't know, the amnesty simply protects those that own these firearms from being charged with possession of a prohibited firearm because now that you have an AR-15 or a Ruger Mini-14 and you don't have a prohibited license, you are actually in the same legal situation as if you had an MG-42 or some other belt-fed machine gun prior to this ban happening. The amnesty means that the Crown will not charge you with possession of that device until October of 2025, which is relevant because obviously that is beyond the scope of the next election. So we're already starting to see some political maneuvering there with regards to dates. Uh, from there, we can jump into where reality kind of comes in and why I really start to think that the Conservatives won't have a choice when it comes to this stuff. Uh, as I said, this entire buyback being modeled off of the New Zealand system has a crucial flaw in it in that New Zealand is a tiny country off the coast of two countries that really strongly control firearms, and by that I mean Australia and China, meaning that the illegal immigration or illegal smuggling of firearms into the country is relatively minor compared to Canada, which is bolted to uh, the most heavily armed country in the world by a huge margin, and we share the longest undefended border in the world with them. So when it comes to the metrics of guns coming into the country, both legally and illegally, it's a very different ballgame. Also, too, not only with uh, the scale of our geographical landmass, but the scale of the guns in question is dramatically different. New Zealand does not have that many people in it, uh, and not a lot of them had guns at the time. So what we were talking about when just into Ardern banned guns was some 10,000 or so AR-15s and affected rifles, whereas in Canada, the government has 110,000 registered AR-15s on the books alone to say nothing of the other 1,400 or so kinds of rifles that they banned, which is really, really the problem for them. Uh, because those rifles, the additional ones, are not registered, they don't have documentation, which means the government doesn't know where they are. So not only do we have a tenfold increase in the volume of AR-15s alone being banned, but we likely have a potentially 50 to 100 times increase in the orders of magnitude when it comes to the volume of guns that the government has prohibited. Now, they have done some fudgery with the numbers here, which again indicates that this is becoming a political potato more than a realistic one. The government has stated in their own documentation that they've estimated 140,000 newly prohibited firearms impacted by the May 1st, 2020 OIC. That is ridiculously unrealistic. Uh, you cannot tell me that there were 110,000 registered AR-15s in the country and 140,000 rifles that are prohibited now because that would mean the CZ-858s, the Ruger Mini-14s, the Norinco M14s, the Robinson XCRs, those big game Africa rifles, you name it. There's only 30,000 of those in the country. I've been working in this industry for 12 years. I'm fairly certain I've been in a building with more than 30,000 Norinco M14s in it at one given point. Uh, and having worked in the industry before the advent of the uh, sort of non-restricted rifle that accepted AR-15 barrels and triggers and whatnot, those non-restricted rifles, those being VZ-858s and Robinson Arms XCRs and Ruger Mini-14s, outsold AR-15s probably 10 to 1, if not more so. 
I received comments from retailers and advertisers saying that we focused too heavily on the AR-15 because it wasn't a rifle that sold in large enough volumes as compared to the non-restricted offerings on the market at the time. This is going back probably six to 12 years ago. Now, the reason for that is pretty obvious. People didn't want to have restricted rifles because they could only take them to the range. It wasn't an issue of paperwork back then. Not a lot of gun owners were overly concerned that this was going to happen going back eight, 10 years ago. Uh, however, they did not want the strings attached to restricted rifles being limited to range use only for a lot of Canadians. Gun ranges are very far away, very hard to access or very expensive or all three. So shooting on crown land, such as a non-restricted rifle allows you to, was seen as a huge boon to the sales market. And that's why you saw tons of companies. I mean, we had companies that started up to service the Canadian M14 market. Uh, M14 doctor did clinics all across the country where he showed people how to tune up M14 rifles and shoot them better. Uh, that branched into an entire industry, a company that made parts for Norinco M14 rifles just for the Canadian market. Uh, the same thing happened with CZ858s. Uh, the company that now exists as Black Creek Laboratories started out as Northeastern Arms, which started out making parts for VZ58 rifles because these non-restricted alternatives were so popular it became a cottage cottage industry unto itself so there are by industry estimates um, over a half a million of these rifles and i would expect those industry estimates are actually even lower than expected because a lot of the records are hard to find i mean obviously vz58s and the, the norinco m14s i'm referencing markets that were burgeoning you know 10 years ago a decade ago the Ruger Mini 14 has been around for decades, many of them. I mean, that rifle was popular on the A-Team, which was the movie or show from my childhood. So there are, I would expect to see probably between 500,000 and I wouldn't be surprised to hear a million of these rifles in circulation. And AR-15s represent the, the smallest minority of those. Now, why the government has played some fudger with the numbers is really easy to figure out. If you say that there's 140,000 rifles that you need to collect and you know that there are 110,000 of them registered, your compliance rate will be artificially inflated when you collect those AR-15s because they are known, they're registered, everyone knows where they are. Um, so I believe that's sort of our first indication where political machinations started to take precedence over reality because if the government was interested in confiscating these rifles and removing them from circulation, they would not be grossly underestimating the volume of them because if you do so, you cannot scale your program out to an adequate degree such that you achieve your goal of taking these rifles out of circulation. So that's one of the major things that I think shows that this program is not being taken seriously by the liberals and never will be. The second component is, for those that were paying attention, the compensation model. Uh, this is another component that I think speaks to the liberals' lack of seriousness on the file. It was a questionnaire that was circulated to gun owners and was actually available to pretty much everyone that could find the link online, where the government kind of asked, what do you think these guns are worth and would you accept this as a value? And gun owners very rapidly recognized that the numbers seemed quite odd. Uh, AR-15 rifles were valued at a few hundred dollars when their probably median price in the market was probably double what the, the compensated val number was. Whereas other guns like Norinco M14s were valued at higher than average and other guns like 50 BMG rifles were half a gain of what they were worth on the Canadian market. We found out later via an access to information request that the government in developing this compensation model actually used 80% of the data for this model. They got that from the US market, which explained why AR-15s were much cheaper and Norinco M14s were much more expensive because Norinco M14s are actually quite valuable in the United States, having been banned from import in 1986, but being recognized as good guns built on forged receivers and US tooling and documentation. So the US market values those rifles quite highly, whereas AR-15s, which are much cheaper to manufacture, are far less regulated in the States and are the most popular sporting rifle in that country are much much cheaper and the Canadian compensation model reflected that. Now I don't give this government a lot of credit when it comes to competency especially when it comes to firearm stuff but the notion that they would seriously use 80% of the data for the compensation model and take that or rather take 80% of the data for the compensation model from the US market is frankly laughable. It's not actionable. It's not realistic. It's asking to be sued because well individual gun owners may look at it as simply unfair. There are 
everyone from retailers to wholesalers that have thousands of these guns in their inventory. And that represents huge sums of money, especially if these numbers are based on a foreign market that doesn't have our logistical, regulatory, et cetera, costs associated. So that's the second thing that's shown me that this, again, is not being taken seriously by the Liberal government and is not something that they intend to pass into reality, much less meet its stated objectives. Uh, the combination of all of this is effectively that the OIC and the buyback associated with it doesn't seem to be something that the government can really get across the finish line. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not going to try. Unfortunately, uh, based on the, we just got the October 2023 budget for that office that I referenced, the buyback secretariat's office, where the 30 or so people are working to ban this stuff. Uh, the buyback budget was largely redacted this year specifically because, and I'm going to look away from the camera here because I need to actually read it, uh, when they redact information on an access to information request, they give you the section of the Access to Information Act by which that information has been exempted. On the buyback secretariat's budget of this year, um, it has section 18D cited, which they're kind of weird. They cited 18B and 18D. 18B reads uh, that the government, that the head of a government institution may refuse to disclose any record requested under this part that contains information, the disclosure of which could reasonably be expected to prejudice the competitive position of a government institution or to interfere with contractual or other negotiations of a government institution. Now, I believe that's probably pertaining to some of the the interprovincial and partnerships that the government is seeking to action this buyback. But the more relevant section is they also redacted it due to 18D, which says that they can redact stuff, information, the disclosure of which could reasonably be expected to be materially injurious to the financial interests of a government institution or to the ability of the government of Canada to manage the economy of Canada or could reasonably be expected to result in an undue benefit to any person, including such information that relates to, and I'm sorry if you if you blanked out through all of that legalese, it doesn't matter because the relevant part is that it says, including such information that relates to the currency coinage or legal tender of Canada, which this obviously does not, a contemplated change in the rate of bank interest, that's also not relevant, a contemplated change in tariff rates, taxes, duties, also not relevant, a contemplated change in the conditions of operation of financial institutions, this isn't about banking, a contemplated sale or purchase of securities or of foreign or Canadian currency, this is not that, this is the part that gets relevant, a contemplated sale or acquisition of land or property. So they've redacted the 2024 Secretariat of the Buybacks budget uh, because it probably includes the contemplated sale or acquisition of land or property. This is relevant because we have previously received this budget unredacted. Uh, so there is a change here, and it would sort of indicate that maybe some of the numbers on that page are illustrative of the government's intent to move forward with this program and maybe action some of this in 2024. Now, that would fit with some of the promises that we've been told that they want to get this thing going. It's been, like I said, pretty stillborn for the last four years. But with the amnesty in place, because I know people might be worried all of a sudden that they're going to do this and they know where your AR-15 is, so they're going to come knock on your door again to repeat. There is an amnesty, meaning that this is all optional until October of 2025. The government is not going to rescind that amnesty because with that, they would also have to rescind the amnesty protecting everyone that owns the guns they can't find. And I don't think they really have an interest in doing so. So it's going to stay optional, but they might announce it. Now, this all kind of combines. This is where we'll get into the political sort of stuff. This all kind of combines into looking pretty likely or pretty alike a campaign wedge. If they announce that the buyback is now finally active and that if you have an AR-15 or an Rinko M14 or something like that, you can hand it into the government and they will issue you a check, that suddenly now when they go into a campaign, they can ask Pierre Polyev, instead of it being an airy-fairy thing that doesn't exist, they can ask the media, or the media can ask Pierre Polyev, will he cancel this program? And in doing so, it further leverages the argument that they will make that the Conservative Party is in the pocket of the gun lobby and that they're going to legalize all of these crazy-looking military-style assault weapons and whatnot, and it gives them more credibility on that file. And that's why I think this whole thing has actually been created, because like I've said now and hopefully have outlined, Nothing in this policy, nothing in the buyback 
actually is capable of meeting the program's stated objectives of removing these guns from circulation in any serious volume to say nothing of the impacts of public safety. So the only thing that looks likely is it is going to be used as a political wedge in the next election. Um, and why I say they'll have to repeal everything and this is at the crux of it is because there are two guns in the OIC that were banned, the CZ858 and the Swiss Arms Rifle, that are a bit problematic. For those that have been around long enough, they'll remember that those two guns, the CZ858 Tactical 2P model and the Swiss Arms Rifles, were all prohibited actually under Stephen Harper as being one, a variant of a other prohibited rifle, and the other for being converted automatics. The government, to, to get into the ancient history, this is going back to the days of Stephen Blaney as the Minister of Public Safety, at uh, one point, the firearms reference table made the determination that the Swiss arms rifles were variants of the SG-550 family of rifles, which are named as prohibited guns, meaning everything that is a variant of a prohibited gun must be prohibited. That's why your Armalite AR-15 is prohibited, but so is everything else that is a variant of the Armalite AR-15. They basically said that the Swiss arms was the same, but it was with the SG-550 rifle. The problem for the CZ-858 rifles was that there was a batch of receivers that came into the country that were converted from fully automatic. Now, that sounds scarier than it actually is because in reality, a converted auto receiver is harder to machine back into a semi-automatic gun uh, because these were not these were not converted semi-automatics as in they had a semi-auto trigger pack. They were fully automatic machine gun receivers from the Czech Republic that had had parts welded into them that were then milled back to make them into semi-automatic guns. And as anyone that's worked with metal can tell you, if you put that much heat like welding into a piece of steel like a gun receiver, it becomes brittle and harder and it becomes more difficult to machine. So technically those guns were actually harder to turn into machine guns than any other, but nonetheless, the Canadian law stipulated any gun that is a converted from a converted auto is prohibited. So those two guns were Na were not named, but moved into the prohibited category by virtue of characteristics of their design. Now, this is all getting very complicated, and this is why I've made this video 30 times. When that happened, gun owners basically threw a you-know-what fit because we had been buying these guns for years. There was thousands of them in circulation even back then, and people were pretty incensed about the notion the RCMP had unilaterally just said, I mean, this sounds quaint now, actually, in retrospect, but everyone was very pissed that the government and the RCMP had unilaterally just said, nope, this gun that you had that has been non-restricted since you bought it, in the case of the Swiss Arms Rifles, was like $4,000 back in the day. So you do the math on the exchange rate. I think they were selling for five figures before the prohibition that these guns were now prohibited. And that led to the Harper government and Minister of Public Safety Stephen Blaney passing the Common Sense Firearms Licensing Act, which is a bill that we wrote about. We interviewed Stephen Blaney back in the day about it. And one of its components that was not very well understood by folks back then was an amendment to the Firearms Act that allowed the minister, the governor and council, which in this case was the Minister of Public Safety, to name a gun non-restricted, which it's sort of, if it's hard to explain, but it's kind of, it makes the road a two-way road because previous to the Common Sense Firearms Licensing Act, a gun that had the characteristics of a prohibited firearm or a restricted firearm could not be named as a non-restricted firearm. They could only be named prohibited or restricted. So the government always has had the ability to say, this gun, the CZ-858 or the AR-15 is a better example, or the AK-47 is a named prohibited rifle. It doesn't have the characteristics that would otherwise make it prohibited because there are sections in the law that say if it's a converted auto, if it's a variant of a named, it, then it's prohibited. These guns did not have any of those. The government simply said, these guns, Uzis, AK-47s, FAMAS rifles, AR-15s, are named restricted or prohibited guns. There was no mechanism for the minister to say contrary to those characteristics. We understand that these are converted auto, but nonetheless, we're going to say that they're non-restricted. That didn't exist prior to the Common Sense Firearms Licensing Act. Now, uh, this is again, it gets complicated, so I'm sorry, but I'll try and slow down. Well, that gave the Minister of Public Safety the ability to move guns by name into the non-restricted category, a section of Bill C-71 repealed that component, making it now impossible for the Minister of Public Safety or future Ministers of Public Safety to name a gun as non-restricted. That part of C-71 came into effect with Bill C-21. It's not part of Bill C-21, but nonetheless it came into effect with it. 
That's why I think if the OIC has to be repealed, the Swiss Arms and CZ858 Tactical 2P models that were previously impacted may not be able to be moved back to their former classification, which seems like a very strange issue for the government to confront when they are repealing an OIC that bans some, like, at this point, probably 1,800 kinds of guns, but leaves two of them in that prohibited category. It seems quite odd to me. And I say that because from a political perspective, if you're going to legalize 15 to 1,800 kinds of gun that have been previously banned, what's two more effectively? And that's also the same logic by which I think C21 will have to go because this is where I'll say it's beyond my pay grade to understand the interplay between C21 and that component of C71 because like I said, it was a clause in C71 that came into effect with C21. If they repeal C21, I do believe that that clause may not be in effect still. It doesn't really matter because uh, if the Conservative Party has promised to rewrite the Firearms Act like they have, that all of this stuff would be logical to lump into one category, repeal, rewrite, and start from scratch because as I'm sure you're probably feeling now, it's incredibly complicated to the point of being less useful because it's so complicated. I, I mean, I've been working at this stuff for 12 years, and if I'm sitting here going, it's pretty hard to understand. I can't imagine how a frontline police officer who doesn't deal with firearms on a daily basis could possibly comprehend any of these laws to make them enforceable and actable and actually practical from a public safety perspective. So for all of that reason, I think, you know, by now, hopefully I painted a pretty vivid picture of why the liberals and this particular policy, these policies of the last probably five to six years don't amount to much beyond political maneuvering would illustrate that as we come up to the next election, and especially with that amnesty being pushed past it, uh, would demonstrate that a lot of this stuff is just going to be used as a wedge, that they will stand in front of Pierre Polyev in debate and the media will be asking him, will you legalize these guns which have been banned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I think that's why all of this exists. Now, why I say the CPC won't have an option but to repeal is that even if Pierre Polyev were to pull an Aaron O'Toole and flip-flop on this, which I don't think is likely to be clear. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. I, I really don't think that's the case. But even if he were, the next Minister of Public Safety, whoever that may be, is going to inherit Dominic LeBlanc's office, and someone is going to come into that office, and they're going to lay a binder on his table or her table and say, here's the buyback. It's a giant friggin' nightmare. What do you want to do with it? Because, like I have said, they don't know where the vast majority of these guns are. They know they don't know where the vast majority of these guns are. They know that if they proceed with it, they will be made to look like absolute idiots because it's very easy to demonstrate how many of these guns they don't know where they are and they can't ban, etc. And I think, again, this is where I say it's all by design. I think it is basically a giant turd <laughs> that liberals are going to leave behind for the conservatives because no matter what the conservatives do in the election campaign, they're probably going to have to undo all this stuff once they get into power because it can't be completed. You cannot keep paying people $5 million a year for 30 people to inhabit an office to make a program that has no ability to actually see a reality. It's not tenable. This is the exact situation that we found ourselves in with the long gun registry. It took a longer time for that to finally die. But for those of us that were around when that happened, it was a useless program that didn't do anything. It was at least able to exist. People did register their guns. Now, only about half of the gun owners in Canada did so. But nonetheless, there was a mechanism by which you could register your guns. And I think for those of us that are students of history, it repeats itself. That's what the Liberals are doing here. They're likely going to enact the buyback or create the buyback program, get it off the ground at some point in 2024 before the election, so that just like the long gun registry, there's a mechanism by which gun owners can engage with this regulatory process, and that will force the conservatives to be explaining why they will scrap an existing thing, which in the Canadian system of politics is always harder than anything else. You know, everyone seems to like more government in this country, so it'll be difficult for them to do. But effectively, we are looking at the long gun registry 2.0, because if the conservatives don't scrap it right away, it will simply consume more and more money without ever actually becoming a thing that can do its objective. Um, so by that way, I've actually said to a few folks that when it comes to estimating costs of the buyback, the parliamentary budget officer, various organizations have cited numbers, you know, billions of dollars is what it will cost to complete the buyback, to which I would say they're all wrong. 
it's a limitless amount of money that it will cost you to buy back because it will never be done. Just like the long gun registry was never going to actually wrap up one day, there was never going to be a day where the long gun registry rang a bell and said, hey guys, mission accomplished. We've registered all the guns. Let's close up shop. We don't need all these people to register all the old ones. All we got to do is register the new ones coming into the country. That was never going to be a reality. Just like this buyback will never be done. It'll never be finished. So until it's done, it will keep consuming money. You can put a price tag on the number of guns that people think are out there. If the industry says there's a half a million valued at X per, you can say that those guns are worth whatever, but they're never going to get them. That means that the government will continue to spend millions of dollars per year trying to, which makes it a limitless budget. It's just going to burn through money. And that's effectively why I think the conservatives will have to repeal it. And it would be logical for them to do it sooner rather than later, because it's just going to burn up more money and exist for longer. And as we've said, the government exists on momentum. Things at rest will stay at rest. If this thing is staying at rest and burning 5 million a year, they'll just keep growing. So I think that explains it all. I hope it's been clear. It's I know, like I said, it's a bit of a nebulous subject with a lot of moving parts. I'm sorry for the length of the video too, because this is one of my longer ones. But like I said, it's, it's a very complicated subject. But I think on the totality of it, based on the fact that this the program was started off on the bad on the wrong foot with this New Zealand inspired plan that didn't recognize that the vast majority of these guns are untraceable and largely unavailable for the government to purchase back, has made it all effectively, like I've said, the long gun registry 2.0. And I think that the government, the liberal government that is, is trying to fulfill that long gun registry model because the long gun registry was a very effective wedge for them for most of the 90s. I mean, we took, when Stephen Harper, for those that weren't around for this, it took two attempts for the conservative government to get rid of the long gun registry. I know it's very common for gun owners to say Stephen Harper didn't do much for us, but there was an attempt, uh, a first one with a minority government and Jack Layton's NDP to try and get rid of the long gun registry the first time that failed when some NDP voters decided Decided to support it. Uh, it took a majority from the conservatives to finally scrap it. Uh, I think that's what we're looking at here. Uh, if we get a conservative majority, it will be scrapped pretty immediately because I really hope um, that the conservatives, and I do expect that from what Pierre Polyev has promised with regards to rewriting the Firearms Act and the number of town halls he's done with gun clubs and gun owners, that he understands that you know we are kind of looking at history repeating itself here, that there is no merits in allowing this thing to survive any longer than it then they can because it's, like I said, it's not going to go anywhere and it's just going to burn through money and find reasons to justify its own existence for longer and longer and longer. Better off to kind of nip that in the bud, as it were, and save everyone the money, rededicate those funds towards better public safety stuff. But I digress because the point of this was, what will the conservatives do and why? I think I've probably explained that now over the last 20-something minutes. Thank you for watching. If you're still watching at this point, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, I apologize again if it's been a bit rambly and tangential. Like I said, I've tried to record this like 30 times with different orders of stuff and it's just been a nightmare so I hope it's been clear. Thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, for our subscribers that subscribe to the print issue, you should have received that already or be receiving that shortly. Canada Post is a little bit slow right now. Second issue is going to print in March. Thank you so much for your support. Hope you guys uh, like, comment, subscribe, all those typical YouTuber type things if you like the content. I will be trying to follow along with the comments for the first few days, especially because I do feel like this is a pretty important subject. So by all means, please share this with uh, your fellow gun owners and whatnot, because I do feel like there is some hope here for those of us that are gun owners. Uh, and I'm going to do some follow-up videos on how we can kind of, if we think this is going to happen, how we can hopefully make it happen on a more expeditious timeline in the future. Uh, so thank you again for watching. I hope it's been pretty clear, even though it's a pretty complicated subject. I uh, hope this finds you guys well, and uh, hope to see you again in the next one. Thanks, guys.